a mic? Hello? One, two, three. Can you hear me? No. Hello? Hello. I'm ready. <laughs> well, we can start without the mic, bro. Do I need to <coughs> click something here? questions for you guys before we start. The first one is, who doesn't know what ORM is? Oh, that's great. And the second question, uh, I've been like listening to many talks today and I decided that I have to, but I may have, I want to ask you, do I really have to say something about Trump or can just jump to, <laughs> to the discussion <laughs> about this design pattern? Okay. So it's going to take about 35 minutes and then we'll probably have questions, maybe even less. Um, the structure of the talk will be like that. First of all, I'll explain you uh, what the problem with data is in, the software, in, in, in writing software, why the data should not be visible, and why, like, what was the problem for many years with the visible data. Then I will explain how I think object-oriented programming is trying to solve that problem and why objects were invented. The next step is I'll show you how Hibernate, JPA, and uh, many other ORM solutions are actually making it wrong, again bringing us back to the original problem. And then I'll show you the alternatives of how I think it should be done instead, instead of using JPA, Hibernate, and all other ORM solutions. By the, by the way, the question is, how many Java programmers are here? And others are, what, what languages do you use? .NET. .NET. Ruby, anyone? Uh -huh. Okay. Well, I'm a Java developer, so I'll focus on Java, but in .NET and C Sharp, there are like similar technologies exist, the similar, similar approaches, so you can probably be able to translate. There's not gonna be a lot of Java code, you will understand it. Uh, and I hope you really like use Hibernate or JPA or similar like ORMs that, and I hope you like them because I will tell you that they're wrong. So we'll have some kind of a, a conflict, which will be hopefully interesting. Uh, let's start with C actually, not even Java, but uh, take a look at this code. On the top, you see the structure. It's a data structure with just two data attributes, uh, which is a point in some space. There are two attributes, X and Y. And there are two functions which are managing this uh, this piece of data. The first one is move to, which is supposed to move, you know, to change the coordinates of this point. And the second one is draw, which is supposed to draw, to put this, to this point into some canvas to actually draw it in a black color. Uh, this is how it was. This is how it was for many years. The data are visible, the data are exposed, the data are public, and anyone can see what's go can see that data and can manipulate that data. So both these two, two functions, they, uh, they use the structure, they use this point, they use x and y the way they want it to use. So the semantic of this data is not, doesn't stay together with the data, instead it's spread over the code which is using the data. Uh, and the code we have here makes, because of that, because the data is public, is available, exposed, the code makes a lot of assumptions about the data. For example, if you look at the, at the method draw, then the, this function, it's not a matter, this function made an assumption that the point has to be black. When the, the author of this, when, when the, the, the developer who was writing this code, this person didn't know what the color is supposed to be. The person just found the x and y coordinates and then made an assumption that the color, let's say, make it black. And there are many assumptions like that. In the, in the first function, there are also some assumptions that the coordinates have to be six, 640 and 480, so there's some coordinate space. The developer of that method of the function made another assumption. And all of these assumptions will be made eventually if we develop like that. We'll have more and more functions like that. And all, in all of them, some assumptions about the data will be made. And what will lead to, it will lead to coupling between these functions, between the code and the data. And this coupling, you know what coupling is probably, right? So there's the connection between them. And it's, the coupling is quite tight, but it's not visible. It's not visible for the data itself. So if you look tomorrow at the, at the, at the structure, at the point of, of the first structure, 
you will not know how many other places in, the, in, the, in your code actually made that assumption about the black color. So there will be many, many places where this black is used because, because different developers, or maybe the same developer, they made that assumption, they, they made their code coupled with the data, but you don't know where it happened. And this is, this is quite, this is a bigger problem because the coupling is tight, but it's not visible. For example, let's say tomorrow I put another attribute to the structure. And I say I have now the color over here, the color, and I have the scale. The color is right there, but I don't know how many places I have to find in the code in order to replace the black with the color from the structure. Because I, I can't find all of these connections. I can't find all the, all the dependence in the, in the code and the data. And it leads, what it leads to, first of all, it leads to, like, like I'm saying, that code will be everywhere. We don't know where the changes need to be made. It will lead to code duplication as well. Because in many places, in many places around the data, we will make many, many times that kind of assumptions, and, and we will inevitably will duplicate ourselves. In one place, we make this check, for example, like on the left. In another place, we'll make another check as well. So the data, because the data are so passive and, 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 and the data is so uh, open and passive at the same time, they're basically like, uh, there is no, there's, uh, there's no active element there, just the, just the data. Because of that, we will have this code duplication. We will have a lot of complexity as well. So all this code, which is managing this data, the code will be quite complex. The complexity will grow with the amount of code show up. So the data stays here, and the functionality grows around it, and the complexity will go up. That's going to be a problem. And also the, verbos the verbosity. So the, the size of code will be bigger and bigger, also because of that. Because data is so small, they're just in the center of, of, of the picture, and the code grows around it, uh, duplicating itself and growing in size. It will affect, first of all, first of all, and, and it will affect maintainability. Maintainability is going to be the first, the key problem, which will be very difficult to solve. It, it's basically will not be solvable. The, the idea of this controlling the data, I mean, the idea of uh, the concept of of data being in, in, in the center and the code uh, manipulating with the data, I would call it command and control. So the code controls the data, the code manipulates with the data, and the data is a passive component. The, passive, the, 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 data, the data structure doesn't know what's going on. The semantic is not in the hands of the data, but it's on the side of the code. And that's why it's command and control. Object-oriented programming offers a different approach. Objects, they show up with the idea to replace the command and control with a different paradigm, which I would say, which I would call trust and delegate. So an object is a different thing from data. An object is an active, com is an active element which encapsulates everything inside and doesn't allow, allow anyone to couple with that data. So nobody can know anymore what is the structure inside that, inside that point in, in, in the space, inside that pixel. Nobody can couple, no, no piece of code can couple itself with the X and Y and make some assumptions about that. Because we encapsulate everything and we expose the behavior. We only expose the behavior, not the data. So data is not visible anymore, only the behavior which we expose. And that's how we come to trust and delegate because we start to trust our objects and then we, when something needs to happen, we just go to the object and say, do it for me. We don't take the data out of the object and then manipulate with the data like we did before. Instead, we trust an object and say, whatever you want to do, just do it. We don't care what kind of data you have inside. Do you have X and Y? Do you have color? Do you have scale? It doesn't really matter. We trust you. And with that approach, we solve all the previous problems we had before. This is how the good code would look in, let's say, Java. So we encapsulate x and y. We put these two methods in this time, move to and draw, make them publicly available. We don't, have, we don't allow anyone to get x and y from us. If they want to move this pixel, this point in space, they just come and call, they tell us what to do. They come and call the move to method. If they want to draw it on the canvas, they come and call the draw method. 
but they never can get the data out and then make some assumptions about the data and rely on that data. It's not gonna happen. So we technically, by encapsulating the data, we technically do not allow anyone to do that. We don't allow them to make assumptions and couple and then make this coupling hidden. And this is called encapsulation. So there are many, many advantages of encapsulation. So first of all, like I said, there's no assumptions anymore, they will not be made. The second one, it's not command and control anymore, it's trust and delegate, because they, 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 they don't take out anything out of us, they just trust our methods and they call that methods. Uh, there's not gonna be no random places, which we don't know about, which manipulate with the data from us. And because of all this, the maintainability will go like higher, it will be easier to maintain, we will, we will always know where the code is, we will, know, we will always know that the code stays together with the data. And if something changes, if we introduce the color attribute, for example, tomorrow, we know exactly where to find the code, we know, we know exactly where to find the methods which need to be, up, which to be you know, improved, which need to be fixed, in order to take this new attribute into account. That's how it looks in an ideal world, in an ideal object-oriented uh, concept. But the reality is different. The reality looks like this in Java. This is what, in most cases, we have when we talk about objects and classes. We don't have the code I showed you before. We have the code, we have this one code. So we encapsulate, it looks like we encapsulate X and Y. We call them private. And then we introduce getters and setters, which you know what getters and setters are. We allow, we still allow the code, which stays outside of our object, to get the data out and to put the data back. So this is what many Java libraries are full of, I mean, this code. It looks like object-oriented programming because the name is class, the class is here, there are methods, there are private attributes, but in reality, it's exactly the same code we had before in C. It does exactly the same. It allows to do the same because it allows these getters and setters. They allow this, you know, static methods or whoever it is, other objects, to couple with us, to rely on this data, to know about the data and make this make these assumptions and couple with us. They will use getters and setters to retrieve X and Y, to manipulate with X and Y, to use them somehow, and then we see again, you see this black, the, the name of the color, again, it escaped the, the object, it stays somewhere in some utility class, we don't know where it is. When we, when, when we introduce the attribute color in, the point, in, this, in this class point, we're not gonna know where exactly we need to find the place to fix it, to, up, to, you know, to change the code so that the, this code will know about the new attribute. So what we have here is Java, is kind of object-oriented programming, but in reality, it moves us back to the original problem. So exposing this data out, letting the data escape the object, brings us back to C code and brings us back to the original problem. So the code becomes unmaintainable. So probably most of you understand where I'm getting at because now I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about that stuff, about Hibernate and how they use objects. And if you use them frequently, the previous slide should look familiar to you because there, this, this, this concept of a, an object with getters and setters is one of the things they have there. If not, let's look at the example. I'll show you how it works in Hibernate. This is Let's say, and then now the more, like now we're not gonna talk about databases. Now we want to put this, uh, this object, this point, into the database, the persistence layer. So we want to, to persist it somewhere, we want to give it a database, so that when we shut down the system, we start it again, it gets back from the database, and we know where that pixel was located. Uh, we want that point, we want that object to know, I mean, some, somehow we want to save it to the database and then somehow later we want to be able to retrieve it back. So how we do it in Hyperlane, how we do it in JPA, uh, in Java. So first of all, we create this class which is called uh, an entity. So we annotate it, this annotations uh, uh, inform Hyperlane what's going on. Uh, we have these two getters, two setters, and also the, the getter for the ID, so we can find that thing in the database. And now the code, it's kind of, a, this is the most complex piece of code here, so don't like, don't, don't really like 
you know, try to read it through. But the idea is that, first of all, we start a transaction, then we create a query, SQL query, kind of SQL. Uh, then we inject the, the, the parameters so we know what kind of, what, what's, the, what's the ID of that point. We retrieve that point. Then we change, we retrieve that point, which is actually not like the, the object which encapsulates everything, but a so-called data transfer object. So it's an object with setters and getters, which is very close to that data structure we had in C. So it comes back from the Hibernate engine with the data injected. Then we manipulate with that data and bring it back to Hibernate saying, and now save it back to the database. And we close the transaction. So the way it looks more <laughs> graphically would be like that. This is our code on top. So this is what I just did. I just took a piece of it. So we have two two basically points of control, but three actually. The, the main one on top, which is doing command and control thing again, because it controls these two elements, which kind of report to it. So this is the guy on top is in charge. On the left, we see the point, the class point, an object of class point with two, two well, setters and set X, set Y, and also two getters, get X, get Y. And on the right, we have a big engine which is coming from Hibernate, which knows how to save that object to the database. So first of all, we, we talk to two, to two uh, uh, points of contact. We do command and control. So, so we, we tell one point, we, we ask Hibernate, give us this data structure, then we'll manipulate with the data structure, then we put it back. So what we have on top is exactly the piece of code which now, has, which now makes a lot of assumptions about our structure of the database, which knows what's going on, and we have exactly the same problem like we had before with this black color attribute. So if something changes in the structure of the database, that code has to be changed. But we don't know how many more pieces of that code we have everywhere. We can't find them because there will be many, many clients, that I would call it a client who is actually, you know, who is working with us, there will be many more clients like that, which all will contact the, the, the Hibernate agent, and they will communicate with our, with our object. But if something changes with an object, if we change the structure of the database, for example, then we will need to you know, somehow find all the places which are working with that object. So on a high level, it will look like this. The, the, one, the, the object point is on the left, the Hibernate session, session on the right, the JDBC is inside. JDBC is a Java library which actually makes database connections. So the, the, the session, session from Hibernate, the session kind of encapsulates JDBC, so we don't know how it works with the JDBC. It's inside, which is good. So we just talk to the session, we just, inter we just interact with the Hibernate, and we interact with, the, with our object. So the client is in charge of putting these pieces together. Like I said, there will be many, many problems with that. The maintainability, first of all, will suffer. So this ORM approach seriously affects maintainability. Because the code which we have with the client, like in the previous example in C, it will be everywhere. We'll have many, many places where this code, which knows about SQL, which knows about structure of the database, it will be duplicated, it will be bigger, it, it will grow, it will be complex, it will be uh, out of our control. The object on the left will know, will know nothing about this code. If you look at the object point, it will look like this. Let me scroll a few slides back. It will look like this forever. It's a simple class which will not going to grow. It will stay like that. And the code around this class will, be, will grow and grow and grow. You will have many, many places which know how to manipulate with this data. It's exactly what we had in C 40 years ago. It's exactly what object-oriented programming was supposed to solve and solve by introducing object. And then Hibernate put us back by suggesting to use that so-called data transfer object. It's a primitive objects which are not really objects, but they're supposed to transfer data. That's, that's, the, that's the idea, that's the design, which actually not making the code better, but even only, only worse. So what is the solution? The solution is get back to encapsulation. That's what I'm proposing. And not just me. You can Google the internet, or you can Google for it, you can find that many people are saying the same, that ORM, in the way I just explained, is the bad idea, because it's, it's not object-oriented idea. It's not 
we are losing the concept of objects. We're losing all the advantages object-oriented programming gave us years ago. We're just we're just jumping back to procedural programming. You also say again? You also lose the advantages of a database, basically. Yeah, because, well, yeah, that's right. Well, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a secondary point, but that's a good point, of course. The, my primary point, I'm talking, I'm focused now on object-oriented and not object-oriented. But that's a good point. You also lose a lot of advantages of the database. You, you, you lose the power of the database because the majority of, the majority of, um, uh, because the functionality, you, because basically you let this, you let this engine manipulate with the data, and all they can do is a quite limited amount of things. This engine, no matter how powerful it is, it's still a limited amount of functionality they can do. Just looking at your uh, data transfer object and understanding how to get the data from here and put it in the database. Somehow it will be done, of course, but because you're not in charge, because the, the object point cannot, doesn't know anything about the database. This object doesn't know whether it's MySQL or Postgres. The object doesn't know whether it's SQL even or no, no SQL. The object doesn't know anything. It just holds data like a data structure. And then somebody comes in, takes the data, in some, and then in some universal, generic way, puts that data into the database. So that's a good point, that you cannot, in this way, you cannot control what's going on, because somebody else, the client, is, is in control and, and that thing. So what's the alternative? This is the alternative. Encapsulate. So put this stuff into the object. That's all I'm saying. So we need to make sure that the object encapsulates everything, including the way it persists itself, including the way it saves itself to the database and retrieves it back from the database. And that's how the picture will look. So the client, I'll show you the code now, I'll show you Java code. So the client will contact our point and say, move to left, move to right, whatever. And the point will know what the adapter is, I mean, how to talk to the database, and then this adapter will talk to JDBC, and we don't care what's gonna happen. All we care on the client side is that we talk to the object, and all we talk to is that object, not somebody else. In that case, we, give, we have to trust and delegate again. We trust the object. We trust that as long as I talk to you, if you're an object, then you will take care of everything else. I don't need to command and control you. I don't need to get your data out of you, do something with it, go to, to Hibernate, inject it to the database, and always stay in charge. No, I just talk to you and say, do what you have to do, and it will happen. So it's trust and delegate. I trust my object in this case. And it's encapsulation. So we encapsulate, encapsulate, encapsulate. That's what objects were for. And this is what the code will look like. More, more or less like this. Uh, take on the left. Look at the left. This is how the client will look. We create a new instance of a point. We give it the ID, for example, one, two, three. This is the, the ID in the database. And then we encapsulate, provide the dependency, which is DB. So we just inform that, that object where is the database, what to encapsulate. And then we say move to the different coordinates. And that's it. But the client now doesn't know anything about persistence layer. It doesn't know how it's going to happen. It doesn't need to make any assumptions about that. It doesn't need to write any SQL. Everything happens later in the object, and the object does, here I'm using this Juke library, which is quite popular, but there are many other libraries. So the Juke actually helps us to write SQL, to, make, to format the SQL query, and then it goes to JDBC, then it goes to Postgres. It doesn't matter. So what happens in the object happens in the object. What matters now is that the client and the object, they're perfectly decoupled now. So if something happens in the object, if I want to change the structure of my database, I just go and change the structure. And then I look at the one single object, and this is one single place where I need to make some changes. I don't need to go around all my clients and see how they're actually using my primitive simple object. Not at all. My object is big. It's way bigger than before. So in pre in, like in, in the Hibernate case, it's quite simple, it's really small, it's data transfer objects, two, three getters, and that's it. It's like it's that size. In this case, it's way bigger, but it, enc it encapsulates everything. And that's, the beauty, and that's the point, and that's important for maintainability. This is how the code will look like, I guess. It's, it's not a real Java code, because I don't really know how it's gonna happen inside. What's important here is that 
the class will encapsulate database so it will know how to you know how to talk to this persistence layer and it will know the ID of this of this element in the database and then the code let's say move to so what will happen we'll say this dot DB update table point set X Y to something it doesn't really matter for me here like how it will happen in this object how it will actually calculate and how it will you know communicate with the database to change the data in, in some specific table in the database because everything is encapsulated and I'm as a client I don't worry anymore about internals so that's that's I think the solution that's how it should be and now one of the last slides so my question is why uh, why did it happen like why we had the problem and then we, we had objects and then people who were trying to integrate Java with the relational databases, they somehow introduced something which is anti-object-oriented. It's not object-oriented. It's, it's back to the, you know, to the primitive way of managing data with the command and control uh, paradigm. Why did it happen? And I think it happened because, because the very idea of mapping relational data to object-oriented world is wrong. So there should be no mapping. Because these things like records and relational tables and tables and cells, they are, they are in the data world. But object-oriented world is behavior-driven. It's not data-driven. So we should not have a one-to-one -one mapping from table to object, from table to object. This is what you know, Hibernate is suggesting. This is what ORM is suggesting. So if you have a table in the database and the table is called users, then you have an object in Java which is called users. If you have a table which is called transaction or payment, then you have a t a an object in Java which is called payment. But this is wrong. It shouldn't happen like that. Because in the Java, we need to think in objects. We need to think user and payment and car, I don't know what it is, like book, whatever money, payment, all the, all the things, all the entities which are coming from the real world, from the world you're modeling, like you're, you're you know, designing. And then you go, and then you think how do you, and then you have a database, relational database. So let's say you have three or five objects here, and then 15 tables in the database. And then you do the, you do the mapping. You, 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 you start to design uh, an object called uh, car. And, and in the database you have three tables to represent the car, which needs to be joined, for example, in order to really represent the car. So how they are managed, how we join them, how we then put them together, and how we map our, our object world to relational world is done through SQL queries. That's what the language is for, this SQL language. But the way people introduced it a uh, long time ago with this hibernate approach, they just looked at the relational world and looked at Java world and mapped it one to one. And this is what the problem started from. Because there should be no mapping. We should not map relational data to objects in Java or in any other language, which is object-oriented language. Because of this mapping, I think the mistake happened. Because, well, if you want to map one to one, then you will, you know, inevitably you will think that if we have the table called uh, users, uh, a user or users, and then we have a name, and we have an age, and we have a salary, then we need to have exactly the same attributes here. And then when you have attributes, of course you will make getters and setters to make the attributes available. And then you stop thinking about objects, you just start thinking about data. Then you map that data to data, and then of course you end up in a data world. But you have to be in, in, in behavior world, in functionality world, in object world, not in data world. So this mapping of the data world to behavior world, what was the cause of the problem? I think so. And there are a number of libraries. I'm not suggesting to use, uh, well, there's one of them is my library on the right down, but this Jupe library is quite way bigger. And there are many other libraries you can find on the market, which will help you to, uh, to, to generate your SQL queries and retrieve data from database and put it back in a really convenient way as convenient, maybe sometimes even more convenient, maybe sometimes even less convenient than hybrid. For small applications, for really small, when you have a few tables in a database, the hibernate will, look, will, will work definitely better, I think so. But, well, faster, because you just put a number of classes, so-called, these DTOs, these data transfer objects, 
You will just design a few of them, you will just immediately map them to the database, and boom, it will start working. But in the long on the long term, if you think about maintainability, if you think about the future, then work with these libraries. Encapsulate your interaction with the database. Don't use Oracle. That's what I wanted to say. I have a book about object-oriented programming. It's a little bit of promotion now. I have a book about object-oriented programming. I'm writing right now the second volume, and it's going to be the whole chapter dedicated to ORM, explaining the same thing again, explaining why ORM is wrong. So if you're interested, Google it, you will find it, probably. In the first volume, uh, there's a lot of discussions about why objects are actually better than structures, than data structures, and what's the point of, 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 of going from procedural programming, from data-driven development, to actually uh, object-driven development and, and, and behavior-driven development. That's in the first volume. The second one will discuss more RAM as well. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. If you have questions, let me know your opinion about all this. Did I touch the nerve? <laughs> Did I say something new? Yeah, go ahead. What about functional programming? What about func functional? What about functional programming? That's the question. Well, functional programming is a good thing, um, definitely, uh, but I think Functional programming and object-oriented programming, they're actually solving the same problem, but in different ways. So the original problem, which I explained in C language and older languages, like COBOL, assembly, whatever, they were data-driven and, and data were always you know, uh, the main thing, and the code was in control of that data. Uh, it, it was not good for maintainability reasons, because it was, it was really difficult to maintain that kind of code. If you look at the, the big C libraries written in C, it's really difficult to actually put things together because, because, because like I said, the code is everywhere and then the data is here and you don't know where actually is the code, where do you need to change, what's the next place to change. So functional programming, make a step forward and say, okay, let's, let's introduce something which will help us to encapsulate, let's introduce functions which will, you know, which will help us to, uh, you know, to group things together and then make sure that if it's grouped here, it's nowhere else. The same is with objects. If we group things together and we call it an object, then we, we, we know that it's here. It's here, it's nowhere else. So we know that if we touch something, we just need to touch one place. It's really good for maintainability. So functional programming is one direction, well, I mean, it's the same direction. They just improve maintainability, I think so. I'm really, I, I write sometimes code in function, I mean, in closure, for example, a list, and I like that. But I think object-oriented programming is a little bit more powerful than functional programming, even though now functional is becoming popular, more popular than object-oriented. But I should say my opinion is that object-oriented programming is more powerful because, uh, first of all, because it, it, it's better, it better resembles, it, it, looks, it looks closer to the real world. If you look around, you see objects, you don't, need, you don't see functions. So functional programming, you need to think in functions, you need to think in uh, function composition, which is something is good for really you know hardcore programmers, but not you know people who are uh, just coming from the real world and becoming programmers, or just people who you know who like to think in, in things they see. So so object-oriented programming is more powerful. I think so. No, it's, it's 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 clearer, it's easier to understand, and more powerful because an object has a state, while a function doesn't have a state. So function only does something for you, but you can't ask a function what's your what's your state right now? Who are you? You can't ask that question to a function. Function just makes a result for you. An object also gives you results, but you can also ask an object who are you. So this encapsulation of attributes is what makes objects more powerful than functions. Aside from that, they're really close concepts. A function in list, for example, an object in, in, in Java. That's why, yeah. Uh, what's your take on the rep uh, repository, uh, repository pattern as it tries to model the database as an Object yeah, it's a good question. Um, I made a slide for it. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was kind of prepared for a number of questions. So it's called Active Record or Repository. It's like kind of closed. So the pattern is probably you know what it is. It's kind of similar to ORAM, but a little bit different. So in case of Active Record, uh, we still have this functionality, this Hibernate's engine, which which stays somewhere, but. In case of in the, in the example, like in the, in, in the case I explained before, we have a, this, this object and the engine, they stay like that. In case of Active Record, they put this engine, which does everything with the database, into the parent class. 
So now you look at it. The point extends some active record. And then when it's time to save that data to the database, then it's called this update. So from the client point of view, now it looks, it looks like we just call move to, and, and we don't see the database. It looks like this. It looks like we don't see the database. Because you see, it kind of encapsulates everything. But in reality, what I think about this pattern is that it even makes the code worse than, than ORM. Because, uh, because still the object is not in control. Still the object doesn't, doesn't write the SQL. Still the object relies on some engine, which is in the pattern, in the parent class, that the parent class will come back, and that's why I made them protected. So the parent class will come back and get the data attributes and use them. Because in case of ORM, there's, there's Hibernate engine, this is us, and we clearly say that, okay, yes, the object is stupid, the object doesn't have anything, it's just a data structure, and here's the engine. We just clearly admit that we did it wrong. Here, we kind of look like, you know, we did it right, so now there's, they stay together. So now when you talk to me, when you talk to the object, then you don't see the database. But if you look closer, you understand that the object is still, you know, a data structure. It's still a primitive data container with attributes. But the way these attributes are used, the, the usage is coming from the parent class. It's, it makes things even more complicated, in my opinion. And the SQL is not visible here. So we don't know, again, the same problem with the power of the database. Again, we rely on somebody who will use us as a, just a data container and somehow will put this data into the database. So I think my, my take on this pattern is, is that it's even worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I'll repeat the question so if I understand it right. So what about the, 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 like the service layer? So now we're talking about persistence layer and you're asking what about the service layer? When As the, the web service, you uh, communicate with the XML through, you have a client that connects with a web service to a server, uh -huh. you usually communicate with the XML complement automatically generating code. Mm -hmm. It's similar to the database, but that's the place where I would pack a lot of classes Ah, I get it, I get it. You just make, I get it. You're, it's probably talking about like a SOAP or that yes, kind of, that kind of thing. Okay, yeah. So the question is like, this is now we're talking about persistence layer where we, we, we connect to the database and we retrieve data through SQL question, uh, the SQL language. But there's another use case where a similar idea, exists, well, the similar design will exist. We have the SOAP, uh, it's kind of the, uh, the XML interface with the, some, some, you know, some foreign client where we make, make HTTP connection there and then the data coming back there in some XML format. And then in Java we have a library which maps this XML to an object. So that when, we, when the data is coming back, they're not coming back in the XML format, they're coming back in a big object with a lot of getters and then we just get, 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 get and then we understand what came to us. I think it's exactly the same problem, so it's also wrong in that case. We, we don't have time to explain, I don't have time to explain how we do it better, but this is a good com comparison. It's a good comparison. It's exactly the same problem with turning objects into data containers and then getters inside there. And then again, the object is here. The web service which connects somewhere is, is somewhere here. And then the service injects data here. So we, 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 just, we, just bring, we just split them apart even when we have to keep them together. So the object has to know everything about that service. The object has to encapsulate that an HTTP client, and the object has to know how to connect and how to retrieve the data. So it's a good, it's a good, you know, it's a good uh, comparison with that problem as well. I totally agree. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Is it, isn't it possible to use Hibernate without get, getters and setters? Well, you can you can just remove getters and setters and just use attributes. That would be even like even worse. You can just have you know just public attributes without getters and setters. But I think your question is not about that. I think your question is how we can use can we is it possible to use Hibernate without these data transfer objects, right? And to just let them you know connect. I mean, talk to the database somehow and return us data somehow without having this you know this primitive without exposing the X and Y. 
without exposing, no, it's not possible. They're, they're designed to be like that. The hypernet is designed to give us data back from the database in form of that primitive data transfer object. Whether there are getters, setters there, or just public attributes, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. What matters is the hypernet is here and your object is here. And the hypernet returns you back an object, you do something with this object, and you return it back to the hypernet. They stay like that on the same level, and you're in charge. What I'm suggesting has to be like that. You're here, here's the object, here's the, hi not hibernate, but one, some library, it doesn't matter which one. So they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be horizontally like that, and you're in charge. That's wrong. They should stay like that. You're on top, then an object, and then everything else goes into the object. So the object knows everything what's happening. Yeah. But uh, what you propose is that the SQL uh, queries have to be written in the object. Yes. The object has to know everything about stored procedures, about all the queries, so everything. Cannot, it cannot know what a stored procedure does. If you if you uh, write a uh, like great uh, uh, get a select stored procedure, for mm -hmm. example, and call the select stored procedure from the object, the object doesn't know what the select, select procedure does. Well, yeah, you're saying that some logic will be in this in the stored procedure in the database level, yeah. So and, you and move the mapping to the database. <laughs> Yeah, of course, yeah, this is the power of the database. So of course some databases will allow us, will allow us to move some code into stored procedures in order to optimize their performance yeah. and for many, many reasons. Which is good. Which is perfect, yeah. But the object doesn't know how it's mapped. Well, the object doesn't know how to do it, but this, well, you as a developer, you will eventually know how to connect to that stored procedure and this, this knowledge you will have to put somewhere. And I, I'm saying that you have to put it into the object. So the object is the only place which knows anything about that stored procedure. So you design them together. You design the database, you improve the database, you introduce new tables, new stored procedures, views, whatever. And then you design an object which knows everything about that, that piece of, I mean, that structure. And they live together. The persistence layer and an object. And then if tomorrow, for example, you decide to replace your uh, database, your relational database with NoSQL database, instead of MySQL you decide to use MongoDB, then it's going to be easier for you because all you have to change is you can go to your objects and change, and change the code that which is inside that object. Not go everywhere and look for SQL queries in the entire application. Sometimes, sometimes the SQL queries they exist on the service layer. Sometimes I've seen that exist on the on, on the level of views. It happens. So the SQL will be everywhere. But in the case in the, in the design I'm proposing, the SQL will stay only inside that object. And all you have to do if you want to change, if you want to migrate to MongoDB, or maybe migrate partially. You don't need to migrate the entire database. Maybe you decide to move a few tables to MongoDB because it's going to be faster, like logging, for example. All you do is you go to one object which is responsible for that particular entity. You see how that object you know, manages this, persists that thing in the database. And then you change it, change it to MongoDB. You don't need to go around and look for all the code around, like how that you know, how that hibernate was used here, here, and here. Like the same problem like we had in C code. We had to go everywhere and see who else made an assumption about the color which was black. How many more places? Tons of them. In this case, we'll have exactly the same. How many more places actually wrote SQL queries, SQL queries and, 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 and placed them everywhere? I'm sure you've seen that, like, they're everywhere. Eventually, the application is big, you will find them in many, many places as SQL queries. And people eventually will start to create some utility classes, some, some, you know, some blocks of code which will, you know, in order to, to put them together because it will be nightmare. I mean, maintainability nightmare. To get rid of that, just encapsulate it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll repeat the question. So the question is like, uh, it's a it's a good good point. So you're saying that in in a properly designed application, you have a you have a kind of a persistence layer or some layer which is responsible for all the SQL manipulations, and all these SQL queries they stay in that layer more or less. 
more or less, right? In the, in the properly designed application. So, but how many properly designed applications I've seen in my life? Not so many. So they all start like that. They, they all start like properly designed, and then somebody comes in and say, hey, I need that, you know, that user from the database. Okay, sure, here's the database, and here's the user. I just get it from there. Am I in some persistent, in some service layer? Who cares? I just need it now because the customer is waiting. And then we'll have more and more like that because it's available, because, you know, because we can do it, and then it will be everywhere. Well, in my experience, I've seen it many times. I've never seen an application where people actually, you know, keep that SQL queries in one layer always and they never jump, and they never escape and they never, you know, leak to other layers. So, but, but your point is good. I mean, if you design it perfectly, you will have like a layer with SQL queries, but still, why not put them right into objects? Why making this layer on top of objects? Why having objects here and then some layer with SQL queries? Let's move this layer into the object. We will have objects, and then inside all inside each of them, we'll have this persistence element. Yeah, I think so. Well, one of the good things for ORMs is that you can you have this uh, the repeated self aspect. I mean, and that could also be an uh, idea of having this this uh, whole thing to layers. You can actually reuse some of the queries. You don't have to write them again and again. Just update them like a full command name. So you you're saying that in, in again if we use the hibernate or ORM properly, then we will not write SQL queries at all, right? It will just automatically happen. Oh, no. Uh, you don't have to repeat the same query again and again. Like each amount of code, you're getting like code all over. Basically, it's the same, creating the same. Well, yeah. Again, again, it's a good point. Again, if you don't repeat yourself, if, for example, you need to retrieve the, the the user from the database, you just write it in one place. You just could, you just get the hibernate, you get this user object, and you I mean you get the hibernate, you retrieve this user object, then you rename the user and you put the user back. For example, you design it right, and it happens in one place. But then eventually you will have another place where you need to do some similar manipulations or exactly the same manipulation. And you will have you will be very tempted to do it again in a different place because you will probably forget, for example, for the place you've done it already. So like in this example with the C code, you wrote you write a code which you know which moves the point from left to right. But then in half a year, in a few months, you need to do exactly the same and you just forget that you already have this function somewhere. And how can you find it? You can't find it because if you look into the object, in the user object, there is nothing. If you look in this in this in this code and I'm coming to you and say, you know what, I need to I need to be able to move this point. Can you do it for me? You'll be like yeah, sure, where is it? Where is this functionality which actually moves this point? I don't know. It, it was somewhere, I, I remember, I swear. But you will just say, okay, I'll write it again. It's not so difficult. I have the hibernate. This is, this is the point. We'll just put the things together. Ten lines of code. Good, it works. So it will, it will happen eventually. It will, it will happen inevitably. Because the code stays aside from the data. It stays somewhere else. This code. This code. You see on top. When I look at this class on the left, I don't see that code. They don't stay together. That code is in the service layer, for example, and that one is in the persistence layer. They are, you know, they're separate things. We know that they're connected, but we know only when we write them, when we connect them together. Then we, we see that connection. And then when time goes, in a few months, they just stay like that, and then we need it again. How can I find that code? Yeah. Well, uh, maybe you should uh, co-work with Jimmy Boga and his solid uh, uh, speed, uh, session, mm -hmm. which handles the same uh, uh, problem from a different uh, uh, view. He came from a, a, a muddy uh, uh, architecture, mm -hmm. uh, and you are coming from a, a separation of uh, commands and data. Uh -huh. It's uh, the same, and I think it's, it's clear speakers at this conference are having this topic. I think there's something wrong with us developers uh, that we, uh, we need to have these features. And when you look through a stack overflow or the internet, you find a lot of questions which boil down to the fact that control uh, this command and control pattern uh, mm -hmm. is uh, throughout the whole architecture of the, uh, the developer. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree that that's a good point. I'm not the only one saying that. I'm not the only one seeing that problem. 
there are other speakers at this conference also saying quite similar things, maybe, maybe exactly the same thing. But my point is that encapsulation, this, this whole point of this talk, that encapsulation does not exist when we're talking about ORM. The ORM violates the encapsulation idea. And encapsulation is the only way to solve the maintainability problem. Because we don't have encapsulation, we inevitably have maintainability problems. That's all I'm saying. I think we're running out of time. Maybe one more. Yeah. What, what if you have a lot of re relations uh, in the database, and, and how how should you go about mapping? Your, you shouldn't map your objects to the data. That's what you said. Mm -hmm. But what's the problem? Isn't there a risk of you having two models, and, and you you don't know which one was that connected to that one and that one? Well, yeah, it's a good question. So uh, let me let me re restate the question. So uh, if I have many different tables in a database and there are many relationships between yeah. them, so we need to join them here and there in order to re get some results. And then we have also complex structure of objects. So we have objects, 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 tables, tables, tables. And then we don't map them one to one, like we just discussed, because it's wrong, but we map them somehow. So let's say this object works with five tables. Another one works with two tables. This one works with another five tables. And this one works with exactly the same five tables, right? Yeah. So we eventually may have quite complex mapping structure, right? Which will be quite difficult to understand. And this is good. This is not a problem. Because every time you look at one object, you see what it connects to. We look at the object and they see, okay, it, uh, this object works with five different tables. It joins them together in five tables. No problem. When I look at another object, Okay, it works with exactly the same five tables, but I don't care. Because every time I look at one specific area of concern, I only care about this object. And I look at it, and I understand it, it's easy for me to maintain that. If I don't like my database structure, I go here, I open my database, I look at the tables, I redesign it the way I want it to redesign, and, and, and this is a different area of concern. So they're separate. Here I design objects, I think about objects, I think like I think like objects. And here I think like relational developer. It's like two different things. So it's not a problem at all. If this mapping is messy, it's not a problem because every time I can I can solve these problems one by one. One object, I look at it. If I see two objects which kind of duplicate each other and they look similar to me, I can also like take a look at whether they're the same. Maybe this is the user and this is the, the, the person. Object called person, object called user. They were different a year ago. Now they're becoming more and more similar. And now look, this is exactly the same. So what? No problem. I just delete one of them. But I'm still thinking. I'm, you know, I'm thinking proper in objects. That's it. Thank you very much. One more time. Thanks.